Many of you have experienced the truth that a person or a family's life can forever change in a moment's time. Some call these shipwreck events when life as we've known it breaks and shatters apart, or what we assumed would hold no longer does. This could be the death of a child, but it also can be an unwanted divorce. It could be a financial collapse, or it could even be an action that creates personal shame that we've done ourselves. For us, May 20th, 1998, was a day that forever changed life. Four friends came to our door. It was 6 a.m. in the morning, so I was excited. I thought they were kidnapping us for a breakfast to celebrate the end of spring term at Whitworth University, where Jim and I taught. But instead, they gave us the devastating news that our 25-year-old daughter, Krista, was killed 7,000 miles away. A speeding bus had plunged over a cliff in Bolivia, where Krista and her husband Aaron had committed to a three-year volunteer opportunity. As one, a mother who'd lost a daughter, plus living with three bouts of breast cancer, and for years reading student journals as they explored their own losses, I became immensely interested in whatever gives some people inner strength and resilience when difficult things happen. I was really grateful for the writings of Viktor Frankl. Some of you have read the book, Man's Search for Meaning. He's an Austrian psychiatrist, but he was also a prisoner in the Nazi camps, in the horror of those conditions. And he started observing, and he became very aware that the key factor of survival was the inner life of the prisoner. So when a prisoner would come in, and if they had some sense of purpose and some sense of hope, they could endure these evil conditions, even sometimes sharing their scarce food with others. But when a prisoner came in who had very little sense of purpose and no hope, they literally died within days. He concluded, that we often cannot choose life's experience that are, are handed to us, but we do have the power to choose our attitude and our attitude and our way under any given circumstances. This has led me to my premise for today, which is that if we can create practices and places that pay attention to the life of our soul, we have a better chance of living with vibrant purpose, maybe even joy, for ourselves, our families, and for our communities. But it isn't easy. There are so many distractions. Uh, we live in a culture that overtly and subtly sabotages the soul. And we're very easily distracted by things such as constant consumerism, very appealing entertainment, 24-7 noisy news, even our great divide and divisions in our country today. Uh, and all of these distractions keep us from hearing uh, and having times of silence and solitude where we can listen to our inner self. There's a writer who's actually in town this week, Timothy Egan, and he says that malnutrition of the soul is the pivotal plague of our modern world. And this can be extremely discouraging, except that there are positive alternatives. I do want to say, when I use the word soul, I'm simply talking about our inner spirit where we feel truest to ourselves. The first is that we can choose to pay attention to the power of the pause. That can be an occasional pause, a day, a few days, maybe longer if needed. But these are especially important in times of 
life transitions. I think of when it, right before a firstborn child is born, there's no, not going to be much pause after that. Uh, it can be when we have to make a life decision, or it could also be when we are having to live in shipwreck. After Krista died, I uh, stayed teaching at the university, but I disengaged from everything else and gave myself the necessary time, which was really months, to grieve this loss. I would read a lot of Krista's writings. She was a poet, I'd read her poetry, I'd read her journals, her emails, letters, letters people sent about her. I also am a writer, so I was writing an essay called A Terrible Beauty during this time, um, and I cried a lot. But having my heart have time to do this, uh, eventually I came to a place where I could believe what was in a song, one of the hymns sung at her memorial, All is Well with My Soul. And within those few months, I began to believe that I could live again creatively and re-engage in the world without her physical presence. Jim, that spring, went down to Central America again, taking students, and he went to El Salvador, where he uh, attended with the students uh, the chapel where Archbishop Romero was assassinated. It was a pivotal time for him, and afterwards he called me, and he said, honey, we have got to do something besides cry to honor her life. That gave us a place for healing energy as we formed the Krista Foundation for Global Citizenship, which encourages other young adults engaged in a year or more of service like her. We started with nine, and there are now 330 that have served in over 60 countries and in 48 American cities. And it's from the Krista colleagues that I really saw the power of the pause. We would invite them when they returned from quite often difficult service assignments where they saw a lot of human suffering. And we invited them to leave their busy life for just a few days, come together for a debriefing retreat, and think about what really happened for them in their inner spirit that they want to have become a part of their future lives. Let me give you a couple of examples. Nathan Williams is a brilliant physics student, and he was serving in the Peace Corps in Burkina Faso, which is a very impoverished African nation. When he finished, he went to Germany, where he was a student at the most prestigious uh, theoretical physics program in the world. He came home after the first semester and came to the debriefing retreat, and as he listened to other students, or colleagues, and then he told his own story, he realized that after what he had seen on how much the citizens had so little, even electricity, in the village where he worked, that he wanted now to use his love of physics for concrete ways to help citizens. So he took a bold step. He withdrew from his program. He went over to South Africa to attend a sol an international conference on solar paneling. He enrolled at the Nelson Mandela University in applied physics. He's just recently graduated from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and he is living his dream as he is working with several other researchers on the African electric grid for four nations in West Africa. He is thrilled with that choice that happened because he listened to his inner spirit. Now, Lindsay Leader was a Krista colleague who was with Jesuit volunteers, and she went to Houston where she worked in a hospice house with in indigent AIDS patients. When she came to the debriefing retreat, she acknowledged, she said, I'm really burned out and I'm pretty cynical about volunteer service. As she shared her story during the week and listened to others, she realized, she said, I am not just heartbroken. My heart has been broken open. 
That led to a career shift. She decided she wanted to go into the medical field, and she has become a nurse and is working in Seattle. In the last several years, has had three or four different ways of using her medical skill, and is thrilled and finds meaning every day. These two adults remind me of one of the Krista colleagues that I was just standing in the line at lunch one day, and he said, "My heart has taken me places." That my mind never imagined I'd go. I'm very realistic. A lot of us can't take several days off. That just does not work. But what we can do is take a daily practice that, if we are faithful to it and disciplined, can make a significant difference in our inner life. Some of you I know are already doing this. It might be meditation. It might be journaling. It might be walking or yoga, or even listening to apps like for mindfulness and breathing. One of the next things that we can do for attention to our soul is to be aware and understand how much our physical environments affect our inner spirits. And so we began to ask a question: What if? We could create a tangible place for Krista colleagues to experience community that experiences the idea of community, but in real life. So we had an old, dilapidated barn above our house. We chose to tear it down, and we built what is called the hearth. It's a guest house, and we built it primarily to use within the Krista colleague community, but also for many community gatherings. We wanted it to be a place of deep hospitality. Now, our next question was, how do our inner furnishings and inner spaces affect our sense of community and our sense of self when we were in these spaces? So we began to actually put a lot of attention into the emotions that are caused by paint colors, about how natural. Stone and wood and vibrant art can affect our sense together. We literally see people stay at the table for hours, sometimes in deep conversation, lots of times in just light, fun ways of getting to know each other again. Next thing we thought about was gardens, and we decided to build global gardens as we've done global rooms up in the hearth. And one of those was an Asian garden. And we asked Ed Sudakawa, would he come and help us understand some principles about Asian gardens? So he came out one day. We were building the waterfall and pond then, and he told us about the concept, the Japanese concept of shibui. Shibui, when it's talking about gardens, refers to the ordinary that is very extraordinary, and if one. Understand shibui and experiences it, they get an energized calm, an energized calm. And in our high stress and anxiety world today, you and I know energized calm can be a rare feeling.、Uh, so because of that, we put benches and chairs all around the hearth, so people, our guests, could stop and ponder, and just reflect and enjoy the beauty that was there. You don't need to own a house or garden to create beauty. John Muir talks about everyone needs beauty as well as bread, and that we can create beauty whether we live in a dorm, if we're with housemates in a rental, if we have an apartment or a home. All of us can do small acts of beauty that can make a difference in our environment, so that when we walk in, we feel comfort and peace in a place. I'm sure you're feeling the excitement I feel at the colors of the leaves right now in Spokane. Are you getting as excited about those every day? Gather a bouquet and put it on your table,、uh, or you might want a comfortable reading chair. Or it might be just putting candles on a table, but we can all create those things that make us and our, ourselves and our guests feel the sense of welcome and comfort and community. Why does paying attention to our soul matter? First, is knowing that we can drift through life, treading water. 
in the cultural currents of our days. Or we can choose to make choices and pay attention to those actions that will help us awaken to our spirit and where we feel most alive. This takes some time, but it's really worth the effort. Another thing that I think is an intriguing one is about how important the sense of purpose can be to our physical health. That having a sense of purpose will most create a sense of well-being in our lives. This is powerful and important kinds of work. Ask yourself, does this room make me feel comfortable and at peace and in myself? Or are there some things I could do that would make a difference? Could I put some new paint on a wall? Could I cl clear up some clutter? I could do that many a time. Uh, <laughs> or could I do a bouquet of flowers? What would help me feel more at home when I came in and when guests come in? And as we look at our days and the year ahead, ask yourself, could a pause be an important practice in my own life? Could daily pauses be something I could do that would make a difference and get me more in touch with my inner self? And if I need a longer one, could I look ahead on the year and see are there a few days that I could create this? These questions can begin to illuminate our lives. Soul space is something I hope you will choose for yourself to embrace. It will be a gift to yourself, but it will also be a gift to the world. Thank you.